Okay, well, so good good morning. Welcome to one more day of sessions. My name is Pedro Luiz. I'm a doctor student at the Universidade Federal Fluminense, a current member of ABE, Brazilian Association of Irish Studies and of Joyce Studies in Brazil. Uh, the theme of our panel today is translation. We're going to have three speakers. Um, we are going to start with Camila Perucci, then we move on to Natalia Ferrigoli. Ferrigoli, right? Yes, the, yes. the perfect <laughs> pronunciation. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Very good. And I, Pedro, will be the last one to speak. Each speaker, we have 15 to 20 minutes to talk. And at the end of the three talks, we will open to debate with questions and answers from the audience. So you can send your questions or remarks, comments to the chat box whenever you want during the presentations that you collect them to the final discussion. And the attendance list will be available in the chat box as well. So um, without further ado, we're going to have now Camila Peruki. Camila Peruki is a graduate student of theory in literary history at Unicamp a base scholarship holder, member of the Brazilian Association of Irish Studies and part of the research group Joyce Studies in Brazil. Her dissertation is about the interior monologue on Ulysses by James Joyce. She also published articles on this topic such as appropriation and transgression in Ulysses' interior monologue and lessons of Ulysses on aesthetic rationality in <coughs> modern literature. So Camila, uh, it's uh you can start you can share your screen if you want okay. that's on you are you seeing my powerpoint yes yes okay. thank you so much pedro it's a pleasure to be here with you all the purpose of today's presentation is to show some results of a research founded by a bay esp junior research grant entitled The Hidden Part of Ulysses Translations in Brazil. This investigation started from the premise that the studies and even the records of the Brazilian translations of Ulysses had gaps that ought to be filled. As is well known, there are three published translations of Ulysses in Brazil, those of Antonio Ruiz, Bernardina Pinheiro, and Caetano Galindo. They have given rise to several studies, but the same cannot be said of some earlier translated fragments of Ulysses, which have remained forgotten, scattered about in pages of magazines and newspapers. The main ones are a short excerpt referring to the 12th part of the episode Wandering Rocks, made in 1946 by Erasmo Piloto, <coughs> Four pages from ads translated in 1947 by Patricia Galvão, also known as Pagu. The final excerpt of Molly's monologue translated in 1962 by Haroldo and Augusto de Campos and published in the first edition of their Panorama de Finnegan's Wake. And an excerpt from Molly's final monologue translated in verse in 1984 by the poet Paulo Mendes Campos and published in his book of poetry, Trinca de Copas. These excerpts were kindly provided by Professor Vitor Alevato do Amaral. For this presentation, I would like to focus on the first two of them the translation made by Erasmo Piloto and the one made by Patricia Galvão, both translated from the French. Piloto's translation was published, as I said, in 1946 in the literary magazine Joaquim, founded by Dalton Trevisan, Erasmo Piloto and Antonio Valver. Joaquim launched in Curitiba a debate about national and international literary production, promoting the vanguards in a scenario still dominated by symbolism and localism. Its intention was to present a less localist conception of culture, founding a modern horizon of reading. 
Joaquin's title itself, a reference to a common international name, synthesizes the spirit of its collaborators committed to deprovincialization. To carry out this task, the magazine translated into Brazilian Portuguese some excerpts from Proust, Luiz Aragon, Zara, Eliot, Garcia Lorca, Raina Maria Hilke, André Gide, Sartre, Eugenio Neal, Racine, and James Joyce. Translations and also original texts in languages easily understood by Brazilian readers appeared in the column Lesson Berlitz for the composition of the novel, which had two assumptions. On the one hand, the writing something of value implies reading the great classics. On the other, that national fiction was everything available in our language. It is, therefore, an example of the prominence that translation gained in the intellectual debates of the time, when it was understood as a necessary stage for the understanding of our culture. But what would be the lesson of the great classics, especially of Ulysses, for Brazilian novel and its readers? The excerpt chosen for translation in Joaquim may provide some answers. The 12th part of the episode Wandering Rocks. The episode itself stands out, not on with hilarity or pain of Bloom's interior monologues, the obsessive guilt of the self-centered Stephen or Molly's flow of thoughts, but precisely the one that abdicates the protagonists in favor of the rotation of secondary characters. In the translated passage, Kernan happily walks to James Gate. He also meets the one who seems to him the brother of Ned Lambert, who is as like it as Dennett, goes by where Emmett hanged himself and tries to remember where he was buried which brings him to Dignan, who went out in a poof. Finally, even in a hurry, he misses by a hair the passage of the Viceroy. So, as we can see in the summary above, one feature stands out, colloquialism. In this table, there are all the colloquialism from the excerpt. The amount of slang suggests that the presence of colloquialism was possibly one of the lessons of modernism that Joaquin intended to emphasize. Exposing all the translation solutions is not within the scope of this short presentation, but I, we will focus at least on one of them. The expression in red, Tipperary Boston. <clears throat> this expression appears when Kernan sees an empty carriage with the reins not to the hill. The scene arouses in him contempt for the person who, acting carelessly, endangers people's lives. Tipperary is a rural place southwest of Dublin. Boston derives from the Latin word bastum, which means stick and refers in the first sense to a whip made of reeds tied together. Later, it began to refer to vulnerable, apathetic personalities. To translate it, Piloto chooses a compadrado, a word similar to the Spanish version compadron. Both maintain the referential function, but lose the pejorative sense of the original term, and also add a positive sense to it. Compadre is a term that comes from the Latin compater, that is, co-father. The prefix co indicates meeting, cooperation. Words der derived from compadre are, therefore, usually a reference to a friendly relationship. Bernardina opts for cara imprestável, maintaining the referential colloquial sense with the word cara, someone unimportant, and giving it a tone of offense by adding the adjective imprestável, which, however, ends up accentuating it. In Galindo's solution, João Ninguém Capial, the first term retains the despicable tone of the original 
and Capial marks the rural origin of the subject, imperceptible to the Brazilian reader who would hardly associate Tipperary with a rural area. Hoais chooses the term Tabarel, currently archaic. In a literal sense, the word means an experienced, incompetent soldier. In a figurative sense, it is someone apathetic or someone who knows little about his craft. The expression, therefore, captures well both the narrative situation to which it refers, a sloppiness that exasperates its observer, and the figurative sense of the original term, someone spiritless. By extension, the term tabarel also means a country man, so it also retains the meaning contained in Tipperary. As we can see, colloquialism constitutes one of the challenges of translation. Slang operates on the no literal level of meaning, maintaining some degree of particularism. It is historically situated and restricted to a certain social group, space, time, by its very nature. So, slang poses a potential problem. Is the maintenance of the cultural context in which the text was written important, or is providing an equivalent feeling more important? With the delicate nature of these linguistic features, source texts can be easily mistranslated. Five months after this translation that I've been talking about, another stretch of Ulysses appeared in the literary supplement of the Diário de São Paulo. Like Joaquim, the supplement had the objective of promoting modernist authors. On February 2nd, 1947, a profile of Joyce was published together with the four-page translation of the ads episode. Patricia Galvão was responsible for it. Here we will focus on some of her solutions of the narrator discourse. The hypothesis that if, on the one hand, the modernist tradition in which she was inserted motivated the choice of Ulysses, on the other, a possible lack of knowledge of the entire novel in the original language limited the perception of typically Joyce and formal marks. The first point to be highlighted is that Pagu's translations maintains the narrator's sentences in the direct order of the Portuguese language, making at most commonplace inversions, such as the displacement of the adverb to the beginning of the sentence. Let's look at a case. Em torno das cabeças descobertas, uma brisa cariciosa murmurava. Gentle sweet air blew round the buried heads in a whisper. Joyce's phrase sounds eccentric. One would expect gentle sweet air blew in a whisper round the buried heads. Joyce, however, moves away from the term in the expression that would characterize it. In a whisper is a complement to blue, but it is in the final position of the sentence, composing a typically Joycean inversion. Pagu modifies this construction. In the sentence chosen as an example, there are also signs of Pagu's tendency for conciseness, making the sense more direct. Blue and in a whisper become just murmurava, and the accumulation of gentle sweet air, emphasized by Joyce with the absence of the end, is reduced to caricioso. Joyce's inversions, however, have specific causes. In Ulysses' point of view is the main form of emission of narrative information, even when this information belongs to objective reality. The fact that the descriptions are linked to the character perceptions can justify the shuffling of the sentence that subverts its traditional order. Finally, another feature of Pagus translation is keeping many of narrator's verbs in the present tense, as we can see on the table. 
By doing so, Pagus translations further blurs the boundaries between narration and the representation of consciousness, which augments the zone of indeterminacy between narrator and character. This is because in the original, the verbal tense is one of the few signs that differentiate the narrator's speech from the character's interior monologue. The main grammatical mark of the oscillation between one and the other is the change from the third person singular to the first, followed by a reconfiguration of the tense, which passes from the past to the present, based on the change of enunciator. Of course, interior monologues will not always be composed of verbs, on the contrary, the general tendency of the novel is to make them a series of isolated nouns. That's why we said that Pagu's versions accentuates and does not inaugurate a dynamic that already occurs. Although brief, the ideas discussed here aimed to outline the underlying conception of art of the venues that in a pioneering manner present the Ulysses to Brazilian readers, and to describe some passages from these translations, highlighting some of their effects of meaning. With this, we hope to have made clear that to talk about an original aspect of the history of Brazilian translations of Ulysses is always at the same time to talk about our own literary system. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Camila, for this presentation about this, uh, this approach on this Catholic translations, right, of the James Joyce fragments. It's a great contribution to the field. Um, I'm sure we can talk about this later at the end of, of our session. Uh, so, but now we're going to move to Natalia, Natalia Perrigoli. Natalia Perrigoli Hello. is a, a graduate student in the master's program of foreign letters and translation at the University of Sao Paulo and a student in the program for the formation of literary translators at the Casa Guilherme de Almeida. Her research project consists of a translation from the Hiberno English of Maria Edgeworth novel Castle Rack Rant into Portuguese. Um, her work is entitled The Ted Kirk Dialecto Monologue, a translation study of the Hiberno English in Castle Rack Rant by Maria Edgeworth and Portuguese. So, Natalia, whenever you're ready, you can start. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Camila. And thank you, ABI Committee. I will share my slides. Please tell me if it's working. Just one second. Okay. So, can you see? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I I was trying to to amplify. Okay. So That's great. oh thank you. So my research, uh, as Pedro said, said, is about Castle Rack Rent, a novel by Maria Edgeworth. She is an Anglo-Irish writer. And this and on the right side we have uh, the title page of the book. So we see that Castle Recreant is the title and the subtitle is called An Invernian Tale taken from facts and from the manners of the Irish squires before the year 1782. So when we think about that, it's very important because the author talks about two different Irelands. I will try to explain that later on. So here we have Maria Edgeworth. She was born at she was born in 1767 and she died in 1849 
in the in the property of her family the town today called Edwards town so she was an anglo-irish writer like i said so she was born in england however her family was irish and when she's 16 she returns to ireland and she gets really surprised by the cultural differences between ireland and england here we have two pictures of her and in the right side we have a portrait by john downman from her in 1807 so here we have the location of edwards town in the left side we have a map and it's in the county of Longford. And we have the Edwards town nowadays. Is the city has a church and a radio station where you can go there by by Dublin taking a train. Okay, so here we have the Edgeworth Town House where she lived. And nowadays it's a it's a private nursing home. There is no many nature uh, much nature anymore because she because the it's a private property it's not no longer their house so castle recurrent was published in 1800 is the historical context of the act of union when the united kingdom uh, of great britain was united to ireland and they became the same country so the book is narrated by Thady Quirk, the old butler of the Langford of Recurrent family. He, uh, his narrative monologue has many aspects of, di of a dialect approach to Iberno English. It's a variety of Irish English that causes uh, some issues in the translation process. We decided to call Iberno English because she says back there that it's a, an Ibernian tale. So Ibernian comes from Latin, from Ibernia. Uh, it's called Ireland. It, it's another word for Ireland. So uh, when uh, she, by the end of the book, she has a glossary where she explains for, to, uh, to the British readers as some aspects of the Irish culture. So who is Terry Quirk? He, by the beginning of the of the narrative, he present he introduces himself as Thady Quirk, the narrator, or he says he some some men call him honest Thady, or old Thady, or poor Thady. So he wears a great coat in his neck. He buttons up the. Uh, the coat and he wears it winter and summer like a cloak. Uh, he may be considered an unreliable narrator by some critics because he uh, he narrates the uh, the four generations of uh, of the like uh, of the of the castle recurrent uh, pro, uh, uh, long long lords. So the property is in ruins, and he tries to magnify the honor of the of this story. So we have two different islands, like I said, one that Thady Quirks lives in, where we have Longford's English uh, English landlords. I'm sorry, I'm saying Longford is the name of the county, not. We have English landlords, and that receive rent and tithe by the, their tenants who, the people who live in the in the property but uh, are renters as the title itself of the novel emphasizes, the model of ireland takes place before 1782 so it's almost a feudal model and meanwhile edwards ireland is characterized characterized by a national identity at risk so when the when ireland is the same country of united kingdom as uh, she worries about ireland losing its identity that's why she re registers the iberno english dialect in order to preserve their culture 
so the structure of the novel is first we have an introduction by Anne Thackeray Rich. She's an English writer. Then we have some notes on uh, of the editor, some details of the novel. Then we have an, an author's preface that is really interesting because she explains why she's doing the novel because she wants to uh, to the English she wants the English people to know more about the Irish culture. And we have the Castle Recrant of three parts of it narrated by Thady Quirk uh, from different generations of the Recrant family. And then we have the glossary. It has 29 entries. And uh, I think it's really interesting Roman Jacobson's categorization of interlingual, uh, intersemiotic, and uh, the other one is, I, I don't remember, but the interlingual translation is when we ha you have a translation from the same language that is which what no that is what she does in the in the glossary because she is explaining to the English the British uh, traditions that are in her novel. So uh, so we have a dialect translation diagram that I will try to summarize uh, from Sara Ramos Pintos uh, in two thousand nine. She says, she asks some questions on the path you would take in translation to translate dialects. So the first thing we that comes to mind is, will I preserve or not the linguistic variations on the source text? It's so, it's so common when you have a, a dialect novel that in a translation, they use just the standard language from the target, from the target culture. So they um, many publishing, publishing in the publishing industry uh, really sometimes prefer. It's something my advisor says on his on his book uh, called Clube do Livre. So if we if you decide to preserve the linguistic variations, which is my case. We we'll, uh, we have to ask ourselves if we we'll, uh, if time and space aspects remain on the target text. For example, if I will uh, if I will maintain the narrative on Ireland, of course I will. But if not, it would be an adaptation. She says, uh, Sarah Ramos Pinto says. So if uh, if we decide to preserve all these as these aspects. Uh, there are some linguistic resources that we may use, uh, for example, that make clear that the text is not in standard language. We can use oral language, we can uh, apply different variety aspects or to choose a specific variety. For example, if I choose uh, the Carioca dialect to translate, it's really specific. It's a specific way of translating. So here we have a, defin a possible definition of dialect by Dewey. She's an Indonesian researcher, and she says that dialects are user-related variation of language, which are distinguished from other varieties of the same language by its pronunciation, vocabulary, grammatical constructions, and, sy and syntax. Syntax, sorry. And uh, also we have the social and geographic and ethnic implications of dialects. That's why Iberno English recreation of Edwards is so important because she tr Edwards tries to register their, uh, the, the Irish variation. So it's very, uh, like I said, it's very common to use the standard target language because the publishing industry prefers it other than using no standard varieties, as my advisor says on his book. So here we have some aspects of the Berno English. For example, they use father and the other. Is, they use T instead of TH, sister instead of sister, 
been instead of been creature Jesus instead of creature in Jesus learning certain preferred and we also have an example of an interjection that gets uh, aspiration uh, when instead of pull they say seria something like that it would be something like that and also they have uh, killed learned and dropped everything with t instead of ed so here we have the first example of translation which i try to put some signs that it isn't uh, a standard translation so it, he says uh, on the book Taylor Park uh, she, her, his sister actually says, I will tell you no more of my secrets, Tati, say she's, says she, nor would have told you this much had I taken you for such an unnatural father as I find you are, not to wish your own son preferred to another. Oh, truth, you are wrong, Tati, says my sister. So I try to use no vou instead of no vou. Contar mais nenhum dos meus segredos. It's very common on Brazil, uh, the Brazilian Portuguese, to use uh, the singular instead of the plural. So I use that in the translation. Diz ela, nem isso contar lhe ia. Tivera eu lhe considerado pai desnaturado, que penso que se é, instead of você a use it se, por não desejar o seu próprio filho estimado por outro homem. Ah, é mesmo, você está errado agora, Teire, diz minha irmã. So I didn't have a, a, a term to sister that would be sister. I could have used mana, but I don't know because it's a very old text and the, these translations are not final. So here we have another example. He uses pin instead of pen. So he says, and so Teddy, hand me over that pin out of the ink horn. Então, Teddy, me passa aquela pena fora do tinteiro de chifre. Tinteiro de chifre é bem antigo também, e eu tentei usar... I'm sorry, I'm talking Portuguese. And I'm... <laughs> I'm sorry. But uh, I tried to use me, because... Uh, because on Mario de Andrade, uh, in Macunaíma, he uses a lot of C instead of C. So it's a oral aspect. He says on... The first page of Macunaíma. Já na meninice fez coisas de sarapantar. De primeiro pa passou mais de seis anos não falando. Se o incitavam a falar, exclamava. Ai, que preguiça. E não dizia mais nada. Here we have the movie of Macunaíma. And here we have the third example of translation. Merciful Jesus, what is it I see before me? I translated as. Senhor misericordioso, o que é que eu vejo diante de mim? So, I try to translate Jesus as Senhor, it's a Creole variation of Senhor, but it's not a, in a religious way, it's, a, it's a, how slaves call their masters, so I don't know if I'll keep it, but uh, here we have the fourth uh, example, he, here they say he took his jug of whisk punch, my lady was grown quite easy about the risk punch by this time. And so I did suppose all was going on right betwixt them till I learned the truth uh, through Mrs. Jane, who talked over the affairs to the housekeeper and I within hearing. So I translated to, ele pegou o seu jarro de ponte de whisky, minha senhora já aceitava bem com, já aceitava bem, esse conta é errado, tá? Já aceitava bem. I'm sorry, I'm talking Portuguese again. O ponche de whisky a esta altura. Então, eu supus que tudo estava indo bem entre eles, até eu descobri a verdade através da senhora Jane, que falava sobre os casos com a governante, e eu ficava ao alcance da voz. So, I tried to translate the infinity of the verb using an informal variety without the R. Here we have the last example that which I don't like very much, but we have that interje interjection, Fu. What is it you're reading there, my dear? Fu, I've cut myself with razor. The man's a sheet that sold it me, but I have not paid him for, yet, for it yet. 
what is it you're reading there? Did you hear me asking you, my dear? So I try to use just one variety of the Rio de Janeiro's variety, this sh sound in the plural. So I said, o que está lendo aí, minha cara? Ola bola, ora bola, sh. Me cortei com esta navalha. O homem que me vendeu é um trapaceiro. O que está lendo aí? Ouviu me perguntar, minha cara? So, I don't like very much this way of writing. I, I found it on a website that said Carioca with X, but I don't know how I can make it more, more readable in uh in the writing because this this seems like a medication like bolax i don't know but my final considerations are that there must be must there must be a solid criteria behind the choice of which excerpts to be translated so i must have a a criterion on which uh, on which excerpts that are more important to Iberno english and also a solid criterion which uh, with what path of translation I will be taking. I thought that because Iberno English is related to Irish identity that I that it would be nice to choose only one dialect to trans in order to translate. However, I'm afraid it will be stigmatized. The translation gets stigmatized by the way people speak in a certain place. So some projects of audio recording like Nurk from USP that records and, tr and, trans and writes what people are, in transcribe, I'm sorry, what people say uh, may be helpful because I may listen to how they speak and use it on translation. There are these aspects. And we hope that this research may cooperate to develop other studies in the translation area or the lexicography area. There is a professor that I used this, uh, this project in, her, in my final paper. She is called Angela Zucchi and she studies this lexicography aspects so it it was with her that I started to to study this this book, and later I went to the translation area, and also corpus linguistics that it's really helpful in the computer to analyze translation datum. Okay, so that was it. Here are some references and everything and feel free to contact me if you want okay that was it thank you i will stop sharing thank, thank you. you thank you very much natalia um it's a very good uh, it's a great uh, initiative right uh, translating dialects into another culture is always a big challenge because of political and historical reasons right then it's a very important discussion. You can talk about this. Uh, can talk more about this later. Uh, at the end, people were already sending questions in the chat box. At the end, you can answer the questions, and then we can discuss your presentation a little further. Uh, now it's my turn, right? I'm going to to share my screen as well. Um, let me see. Okay, all of you can see this. Please, someone tell me by in the microphone because I cannot see you right now. We can see. We can see you and hear you perfectly. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the paper I want to present today is a discussion involving the relationship between James Joyce and, and William Shakespeare, but looking at this connection uh, in the translations and in the, the Brazilian translations of Ulysses, which this is the research topic of my thesis, my doctoral thesis. Uh, Joyce and Shakespeare, uh, 
share are authors that share not only the relevance they carry in the present time, but they also re represent an innovative disruption of the times for different reasons and different genres. Shakespeare cont contributed to, the, to change theater in his time and literature in general, as well as Joyce changed the way we see and read prose. So uh, the Shakespeare presence in Ulysses contains several layers. In the ninth chapter, for example, certain passages elucidate this perspective, such as the John Allington's quotations of Alexandre Dumas, which is in the title of my presentation here, after God Shakespeare created most that I brought in the title. Uh, I guess it's one of the most relevant quotations that puts forward a specific vision about Shakespeare in one of the most Shakespeare ca chapter of Ulysses, which is the Hamlet chapter, because it shows somehow uh, how Joyce positioned Shakespeare's work in his novel. So, talking about um, Joyce's Shakespeare, that means trying to reveal how Joyce viewed Shakespeare and how Shakespeare is unveiled throughout his work. As Laura Pelakia highlights in this quotation, differently from Homer, Shakespeare is tentacular, fragmentary, non-systematic, being a challenge for those who stood this connection. Shakespeare is an organ alive in Joyce's narrative that brings along a contextual meaning into the novel and their characters. And failure to understand this, the Shakespeare presence in Ulysses entails in missing relevant meanings. So. Uh, Shakespeare may take several forms in Joyce's novel. Uh, research on this connection contains many interpretations. According to Bridgman Boysen, for instance, Shakespeare retains an ambivalent meaning to Joyce. He may represent both a divine and spectral character in the novel. As a divine figure, Joyce views Shakespeare as the creator of his own universe. But this divine aspect ends up creating another dimension, since the ones that follow uh, the creator is supposed unable to achieve him. So this anguish of influence that arises from such states develops uh, the spectral character of Shakespeare in Ulysses, uh, just like Boysen highlights here. Uh, the predecessor, the spectre, the predecessor waves, thinks, intensifies and it condenses itself within the very core of life. This relationship, however, may be viewed in different ways, as I said earlier. Paula Pugliat, based on Harold Love's concept of a precursory authorship, regards the interchange between Joyce and Shakespeare as a collaborative work. So Shakespeare is not only a precursor, but also a Joyce collaborator because it acquires because Shakespeare acquires an individual and unique character in Joyce's work, and Joyce, uh, by his turn, contributes to the canonization of Shakespeare by incorporating his works in his books. Um, he, he have this, this Pugliati's view connects with T.S. Eliot's perspective about literary tradition, that the writers from the past and present work in a harmonic cohesion that sh shapes certain literary tradition. Uh, Manuel and Magro Jimenez argues that Shakespeare is an obsession for Joyce, as the father-son relationship theme is relevant in both works, and in both main works uh, by them, Hamlet and Ulysses. Shakespeare is like the pattern of figure that Joyce wants to kill in the sense that he desires to imitate or even outcome him. So the relationship between them can also be viewed as an agon, as Harold Bloom describes in his Western canon. In this perspective, Shakespeare's and Joyce's man rival. David Weir contends that Ulysses is a modern novel that reconciles previous and consolidated literary traditions, the classical through Homeric narrative, the medieval through Dantesque design and the Renaissance through Shakespeare plot. In his view, then, the whole novel is conducted by a plot with Shakespeare character that combined with those other traditions create a new modernist form of expression.
So uh, James tries to do this is is always a challenge to translate it for several reasons. Um, which then draws the attention, for example, to the fact that the structure of the English language is the one that best enables the joyous purpose and reproduce the mental notation of the characters called as short-mindedness that in other languages may be an intricate, hard-working task that translations are entitled to accomplish. It calls for the relevance of studying Joyce's translation through different perspectives. Yolanta Wazika points out the relevance of studying Joyce's translations in several languages and cultures, for it opens new possibilities of reading his work. She views it as the ultimate act of close reading and interpretation. It allows new readings of the literary text, opening theoretical stances, as a reading is translation, and translators perform the role of keeping alive literary works. Translation of Shakespeare reference in Ulysses into Portuguese then builds a new possibility of reading Joyce's novel and seeking out the Shakespeare made up by the Brazilian translators. So I will show you now a few considerations of my analysis of this intertextuality in the Brazilian translations uh, that everyone already knows, uh, the translations by Antonio Weiss, uh, by Civilização Brasileira, by Bernardina Pinheiro da Silveira, by Objetiva, and Caetano Galindo, Companhia das Letras. Three different translations that come from different contexts and represent different projects. If you all agree that translations are critical readings, we're talking about three different Brazilian versions of Ulysses. So a literary translator must not only deal um, with the means of the source text, but also the intertextual connections that comes along, usually relating to a certain literary tradition. In the case of the Brazilian translations, Shakespeare's work has not the same impact uh, that it does in most of English-speaking cultures, all who have influenced several writings in Brazil. Shakespeare is intrinsically connected with the literary canon in the English language world. The fact that this kind of transposition cannot be heard from one culture into another is an aspect of this research for further investigation and discussion. Um, so the intertextuality with Shakespeare's work in these translations will be discussed through an analysis of the Shakespeare reference uh, in order to observe how Brazilian translators have dealt with Shakespeare mentions in Joyce's novel. And I will discuss here two examples of the first chapter, Telemachus, a very Shakespeare chapter in virtue of the themes that permeate the episode, like the father-son relationship, the usurpation theme, and although the main correlation between them tends to focus on the, corrects, and on the correspondence between the characters, Hamlet and Stephen, the passage selected for this presentation comes from other tragedies, Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth. So in the very beginning of the chapter, at the top of the tower that corresponds to Elsinore Castle in Hamlet, Mulligan, but Mulligan calls Stephen fearful Jesuit when Stephen was about to come up uh, the stairs. Come up, Kent, come up, your fearful Jesuit. Uh, this saying recalls the way Friar Lawrence called Romeo in the third scene of the third act in the play. Romeo, come forth, come forth, no fearful man. Um, affliction is a number of my parts, and the word wedded to calamity. In the Shakespeare scene, Friar Lawrence is regretting R Romeo destiny and is just about to tell him that he has been banished from Verona in face of the troubles that led to the death of members from both families, which may meant at the moment of display that he would possibly no longer see Juliet. Fearful commonly means someone frightened or someone or, some, or something that causes fear to someone else. One connotation is passive as the other is active. And the connection between the plays lies on the theme of banishment that will hover Stephen's mind. The sense of banishment is brought up by Stephen at the end of the episode through the word usurper, which by its turn evokes the Hamlet's theme of usurpation. Uh, Raphael Burton points out that it means, that fearful means, frightening, terrorize it, without referring to any other possible meaning. J. Blackmore Evans 
also draws attention to the ambiguous characters of fearful and the friar's utterance. He points out the meaning of full or few timorous, but brings up Edmund Spencer's interpretation as indicating something terrible and threatening, a fated figure, in virtue of the context that the words as affliction and calamity generate in the passage. Friar Lawrence means that the affliction and cal 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 calamity are inherent to Romeo's destiny and are part of his burden. And this perspective re uh, reinforces the second interpretation. Uh, Don Gifford and Richard's statements guide that do not point out the Shakespeare reference, but emphasize that Jesuits were noted for the uncompromising intellectual rigor. Uh, as for Mulligan, his intention is mock. Stephen's past in Jesuit schools and his later withdrawal to a re religious life. The use of fear for recurs in the well-known Juliet's Nightingale speech in the so-called Balkan scene. In this passage, Burton says that it means apprehensive, full of fear, and Evans also points out the fearful of this passage as mean timorous, because afraid to hear. The translations provide different possibilities of interpretation, as you may see in the following table. Um, apart from subtle changes, such as the use of the exclamation mark by behind you that, is, uh, that ascribes an emphasis to Mulligan's request, while the others convey a sense of com command blended with living invitation, their choice induced different perspectives, though all of them contain essentially the same idea. Mulligan is smoking mocking Stephen's religious past. Uh, in the Shakespeare play, the meaning is related to the anguish Romeo was feeling about the prince's decision, so we might interpret that Romeo caused fear as well because of his inconsequent actions and the many terrible events that followed his life throughout the play. And although the first meaning tends to be more plausible to the context, uh, all translations follow the essence of the mockery, but uh, for example, OS translations deviates from the interpretation of the seriousness that allies with something to be heard of. Execravel means something to be despised and famous and even hateful. Something fearful may be odious as well, or, or even a consequence of the fear it imposes, but it's an interpretation of the word that goes beyond the other definitions. As for the movement Medonio used by Bernardino and Galindo, both convey this sense of fear implied in the word. Uh, we move now to the scene in which they leave the tower to wash themselves before following their respective days. In response to Mulligan's teasing over Stephen's hydrophobia, Stephen claims that all Ireland... Pedro. Yes. I'm sorry, the slides aren't going moving no. forward. No. Okay. And now? Now, yes. Wait. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no problem. Thank you. Thank you for warning me. But you can see right now, right? Yes, yes. Thank you. So I'm going to keep this way so we have no problem. Um, uh, in this scene, Mulligan teases Stephen's hydrophobia. Stephen claims that the whole island is washed by the Gulf Stream, causing Haines, which is an Englishman who is living with them, to ask if he could make a collection of his sayings. In Stephen's view, Haines' behavior towards him and his interest in Irish in general is condescending and only intends to clean away the English guilt in the historical and political situation in both, both countries. Um, speaking to me, they wash and tub and scrub, and invite of Inuits, conscious yet hears its spots. Um, and invite of Inuit means remorse of conscience in Middle English, and followed by the word conscience, this word supports Stephen's conclusion that the Haines has just been condescending towards his respect. The last sentence, yet here's a spot, is a reproduction of Lady Macbeth's words during her sleepwalking in the Shakespeare play. She starts to wander and hallucinate and try to clear the booty away from her hands. The King Duncan's blood, whom she plotted to murder along with her husband, and the blood represents her 
her remorse of conscience that comes to life when she assesses the guilt emerging from the death of her unconscious. Um, David Weir views Lady Macbeth's word evoked by Steve as crucial to understand the development of the Hamlet plot. This explanation of a divide of Inuit is necessary to understand the combination of the Hamlet plot, which finds its resolution in the third chapter when Stephen, like Hamlet, finally take, takes action with his sword. These allusions to Shakespeare then uh, contributed to the structure of Joyce's novel, as the Shakespeare plot is crucial to understand Stephen's inner conflicts in these moments. As for the translations of this passage, um, although there may be few differences in the translations, their choice produces distinct ways of viewing the scene and its its connection with Shakespeare plots. Spot in English um, may convey, just like in Portuguese, mancha, either uh, an area that's different from the surface, from the surround surface or uh, taint or own character or reputation, which invokes the double meaning tendon in his reference to Lady Macbeth's words. The distinction I highlight here is, is how spot is situated in the translations. Hawaii's defined spot as esta mancha, it's a definite spot, uh, not any spot. He brings us closer to the spot, it refers to. Bernardine and Galindo both kept the indefinite character of spot from the source text, Uma Mancha, though we know it's not in spot, it's a specific spot in a deep sense, but the indefinite character brings forth this tension and anguish that took over Lady Macbeth and is somehow summoned by Stephen to communicate his state of mind. Bernardine also employed the translation of here into aqui, which changes in a certain extent the way we read because it creates the image that this spot is situated somewhere in Stephen's perspective, just like this spot is also situated in Lady Macbeth's hands in her delusional imagination. So these examples shows not only the importance of Shakespeare's allusion in Joyce's text, but also the relevance of the critical study of this intertextuality in the translations in order to attain another perspective of Joyce's novel. And this ongoing research then has the purpose of selecting and analyzing the ref references and discuss them through a critical perspective, not only on the examples chosen, but also in looking critically through these passages in the Shakespeare's place. So here is my bibliography and thank you very much for your attention.